This meeting is being recorded. Oh. And we'll give it about five minutes or so. Sounds right, and I see uh, some attendees joining us. We should start, Sarah, because I mean, there is already like 18 people. In Sounds good. Well, welcome all uh, to uh, another webinar and the Medical Physics for World Benefits webinar ser series. Um, MPWB, or Medical Physics for World Benefits, is a North American organization that's charitable based. Uh, please uh, do visit the website of www.mpwb.org. Support us, like us, share it, um, share it on your social media. And we would like to wel welcome our speaker today, Dr. Robert uh, Shooter from the UK, uh, who's joining us um, to talk to us about climate crisis and healthcare. Uh, to me, it's a very unique uh, topic, especially in the arena of medical physics. So I really look forward uh, to the presentation, and I'm sure it will be great. We will start with 45 minutes uh, of the presentation time. Uh, with Dr. Shooter, please feel free to write any questions you might have in the chat uh, section. Then we'll follow that with five minutes of questions and answers, then final comments. And um, we will have MCQs or multiple choice questions uh, that you would have to answer in order to receive uh, the certificate from us of attendance. Uh, of, uh, attendance. Um, there, uh, there's a Google document that we already created with the questions. The link is in the chat box already, but we'll also send it via email after the webinar. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and we'll post it online. It's typically shared on the MPWB's uh, YouTube channel. And with that, without any, oh, sorry, I already have to introduce myself. <laughs> So Dr. Uh, Robert Schroeder works with uh, the clinical radiotherapy physics team at the Christie and Radiotherapy Related Research Group at the University of Manchester. Uh, you're the chair of the sustainability group too, I read. And um, his main focus is the MR LINAC, but he's also the chair of the Institute of Physics and Engineering in Medicine's Environmental Sustainability Group, as I said, which he set up in February, 2020. As part of this, he has written many articles and presented at numerous meetings on this critically important topic. He was also successful in being awarded nearly 10,000 pounds by the Northwest Greener NHS Innovation Fund to estimate the carbon footprint of the radiotherapy pathway. Um, welcome again, Dr. Shooter, and uh, I'll let you take over now. Yeah, I'll cool. stop. I'll sure, stop the share. And Rob, you should be able to. Perfect. Yep. So hopefully you can see. The presentation? Uh, no. No, you don't see the screen? Uh, let me see. Do you see it, Sarah? I do. Okay, all right. Then that's... Okay, hopefully hopefully everyone can see it. Um, if it, if it doesn't appear later, let me know. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about the climate crisis and, and healthcare. Um, and, and Sarah's already given an introduction of, of who I am. So I used to um, I first did a PhD in astrophysics. It's kind of where it started all off. So I'm going to do a little kind of tour down memory lane and talk about the history of of kind of astronomy, I suppose, and well, just a little, little bit of it. In 1990, um, Voyager One, which is like a space probe, um, was six billion kilometers away from Earth. And it turned around and looked back towards the Sun, and it saw this pale blue dot. So this is Earth. And there's also been um, a kind of a lot of um, photos taken from the Moon. And this is Earthrise. This is kind of the Earth rising from the moon. 
the reason I'm kind of showing this is just it shows kind of how delicate life is and how we are just kind of a you know you know highly evolved apes on a on a tiny little planet and it's ours to look after that planet um we're not doing a very good job of it um so this is the kind of the hockey stick diagram this is um global temperatures going up since kind of the, the 1900s and they're kind of going up kind of exponentially as it is and that temperature rise doesn't um isn't kind of spread out equally across the planet um a lot of it happens at the poles mainly in the in the arctic region um europe is actually also kind of um increasing quite a lot more than everywhere else is as is kind of the middle east um and there's kind of quite a lot of projections out there about kind of what this is adapted from the ipcc report in 2018 about kind of where we're currently headed so there's kind of pledges and and current policies from things like the paris um and you know cop 27 and they're leading us to about you know somewhere between two and three degrees or yeah about three degrees three to four degrees of of heating if we didn't do anything at all we'd be up kind of more like four degrees but really we need to be down at one and a half two degrees currently we're at 1.2 degrees of warming and we're already seeing quite a lot of effects um on kind of extreme weather and kind of flooding in bangladesh is one of those so we need to, in order to keep between uh, below 1.5 degrees, we need to follow these mitigation curves. So these were made kind of a while ago, um, and they show that in, in if we'd done it in 2000, um, 2000 at the start of the millennium, we needed to save 4% of our um, global carbon footprint a year to stay within 1.5 degrees. Now we're at 2022, that's kind of, I think it's about 24% we need to save a year to stay within 1.5 degrees. Essentially staying in 1.5 degrees is is now almost impossible um, and just to give you an idea about how large that change is um, when covid started and everyone went into lockdown um, global emissions fell by 17 percent so even all of that upheaval that happened still wouldn't be saving enough um, carbon footprint to really keep us within 1.5 degrees and and even the kind of the hope of um of sticking to 17 degrees within a couple of months we're back to only five uh, five percent lower and obviously we're kind of i think we've overshot we're now releasing more than we did beforehand and part of the reason why climate change or the kind of is, is, is scary are these positive feedback loops so if you melt the ice and it happens in the arctic like i said that's where most of the heating is happening it reduces the albedo effect and the albedo effect is kind of the amount of light that's released and um, reflected back into space and as that kind of light and heat is reflected back into space, it cools down the area. But if you're reducing the albedo, there's less less ice, it heats up the area. Um, and that obviously then reduces the, the ice and you kind of get this positive feedback loop. Another one is permafrost. Again, tends to happen in the Arctic Circle. Um, if you melt the permafrost, it releases trapped methane gas. And 20, uh, methane gas is 25 times uh, more effective as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. So that increases the temperature and you get a positive feedback loop. There's also ones that are kind of directly kind of human. Um, so in every, anytime there's like extreme weather, say it's like too hot or too cold. If it's too hot, we put the air conditioning on. If it's too cold, we put the heating on. They all tend to kind of use um, fossil fuels, uh, which increases the number, amount of CO2 in the, the atmosphere, which increases the temperature. So we get increased extreme weather. There are some feedback loops um, involve kind of the water vapor in the air. So with a warmer climate, you get more water vapor. So you get more cloudiness, which is then reducing the sunlight, which then kind of cools it down. And with increased precipitation from the water vapor, you get increased plant growth, which does um, move some of the carbon dioxide. However, we need to let that kind of plant growth happen. And as we're cutting down far more trees than we're planting, that isn't necessarily a negative feedback loop. So some of the things that have highlighted um, extreme weather. So recently in the UK, um, when we had um, like 40 degrees um there was one nhs trust failed because the it systems just kind of broke because the because of the amount of heat um we've seen forest fires in many places but this one's from australia there's been loads in california um some of the more worrying ones the ones around the arctic circle um there's been a, a lot of those and that is another positive feedback loop because um as the soot from the fires deposit um, fires deposits on the um onto the ice makes it dark so that it starts increasing increasing the amount of kind of um, sunlight that's absorbed and increasing the temperature and um last year 
in February last year, there was um, huge changes and anomalies in temperature in the US. Um, it was like 14 degrees colder than it would have been normally in kind of Texas and areas like that. So one reason why climate change terrifies me is because these are the, these are my two boys. Um, and kind of when you think about what the planet's going to be like in 2050, or they'll only, they'll only be about 30 odd, it's hard to imagine what that's going to look like. Um, so there's been some kind of nice um, work done looking at the kind of the, the temperature differences between now and in 2050. And in places like France, it's already going to be kind of 10 degrees warmer than it is now, because it's one of the areas that's kind of getting hottest quicker. And just kind of the amount of effect that's going to have on just Europe is is hard to imagine. And, you know, we kind of, what's it going to be like to our food production? Um, if there's a kind of going to, if that's going to be happening elsewhere as well, then, you know, temperature and um, sea level rise is going to be kind of causing mass migration. Just trying to understand the world they're going to live in really worries me um, and helps motivate me. Um, but it's hard to kind of talk about climate change without talking about kind of equality too. Um, there's a really nice stat from Oxfam saying the world's richest 1% caused double the CO2 of the combined total of the poorest 50% of the population. That is colossal because um, so, that's combined. And there's this also nice plot from the Financial Times showing that kind of the, the difference between the kind of poorest um, 50 cent and the top 10 percent of um, kind of earners means there's a vast difference in carbon footprint as two. So inequality makes a huge difference to climate change. And um, there's a French um, uh, economist that said the single best way to reduce carbon um, global emissions is to reduce the wealth of the richest people especially if you do it by taxation because you can then use that taxation to kind of um, improve kind of um, sustainable electricity and stuff like that um, and another kind of thing that relates back to our pale blue dot we have one planet we have one dot yeah if we all lived like residents of the US um, we'd need five of them um, and this kind of it, you know if we lived like people in the UK where I'm from we need um, just over two and a half planets if we lived kind of um, like um, Ugandans, I think it would be 0.8, I know 0.6 or something like that, India 0.8 and Bangladesh 0.4. So as, and as kind of a, a kind of global population, we need, you know, getting on for two planets. We only have one blue dot. So we need to look after it. And it's not just me uh, banging on about this. Um, the Director General of the World Health Organization said in 2014, for public health, climate change is the defining issue of the 21st century. The evidence is there and it is compelling. Here is my strong view. Climate change and all of its dire consequences for health should be at centre stage right now, whenever talk turns to the future of human civilizations. Couldn't agree more. Um, depressingly, that was in 2014 she said that. I'm not entirely sure that much has changed. Um, but it, the, kind of the, the impact on healthcare is now being kind of acknowledged uh, the Lancet has had kind of some very nice reports on this and the New England Journal of Medicine has also had um, some nice reports on this showing that climate change isn't something that happens externally it, it affects our health too um, and part of the ways it help it kind of impacts our health is so heat waves directly um, cause you know dehydration they can cause cardiovascular disease and disease and affect other diseases extreme weather including storms and fires um, not only is the, the the impact on emergency and healthcare services, but it also reduces the availability of clean food and water and damages infrastructure. And there's kind of increased evidence that the more we displace animals from their natural habitats, the kind of the more we interact with the, the um, those diseases, and there's more chance they will spread to to us. And as the um, like as the kind of planet gets warmer, the the range and season for um, diseases like malaria um, increases, and there's an increased um, reduced access to clean water, which then increases the chance of waterborne diseases, and increased um, emissions, including fine particulates, kind of tend to include disease in respiratory diseases and um, cancer for lung. And there's a, there's um, some very nice papers out there. Uh, Two papers out there that have basically kind of put a, a kind of um the amount of co2 um released um per kind of death and you can kind of find these numbers and you can kind of combine it with the fact that um the global emissions are about 38 gigatons co co2 a year for energy consumption alone 
when you combine that with deforestation and everything else, it's 56 gigatons. tons. So you can work out the amount of deaths that are attributable, attributable to climate change is between 8.6 million and 16 million deaths. Now, to put that in context with things like COVID and cancer, COVID is 4.5 million deaths in 2020, and cancer globally is 9.6 million deaths. So it's kind of, yeah, it shows you that climate change is important. It's causing deaths right now, and it's going to cause a lot more. And also this kind of figure ignores the quality of life and the reduction of quality of life that's going to happen because of climate change. Um, it also has a direct um, effect on cancer, um, which kind of a, a lot of medical physicists work on. So the air pollution increases lung cancer, UV um, increased because of um, the kind of there's more sun. So that um, affects skin cancer. Disruption to food and water supplies tends to affect kind of GI cancers. Um, so just an industrial toxicants, which is kind of is an environmental effect rather than a climate change effect, but still linked. That affects kind of breast cancers and lung cancers as well. And there's these kind of these very nice papers down here that I've put if anyone wants to look those up because it, it it's, a, it's a very nice amount of work. And um, the problem is that healthcare also has a carbon footprint. So I've highlighted the UK's one. Um, so 5.4% of the UK's carbon footprint is is from healthcare, um, which is large. And you kind of actually then it means we have another um, positive feedback loop because if there's the in uh, increase in extreme weather, and there's more for food shortages, etc. There's going to be more use of healthcare, um, which has a carbon footprint that's that releases CO2 or kind of greenhouse gases that increase the temperature, and it's a positive feedback loop. So we need to do something about that. And one of the things that has happened in the UK, um, the National Health Service has um, said it's going to be net zero by 2040 which is a gargantuan task and it, it's unlikely to really meet that. But it's it's a very, you know, kind of good aim and kind of there's other things you can do as well. So that's what the NHS is doing. And a lot of you probably know what we, we can all do. Um, there's kind of like um, energy efficiency, there is recycling, there's a hybrid car, vegetarian diet has quite a big impact, um, buying renewable energy, uh, not flying, flying and transport in general is a, is a huge impact. Uh, don't use a car, um, have one less child, and also kind of pets. Pets have quite a large impact as well. And we all have about 1.6 tonnes um, of CO2 a year we can use to keep within 2%. And to kind of put that in context, a return flight between Manchester and New York is 1.6 tonnes. So if you fly from Manchester to New York, you've essentially used kind of your carbon budget um, divided by the whole population of the, UK, of the, of the planet in one go. Another thing to do is kind of educate yourself. This book is absolutely brilliant called How Bad Are Bananas by Mike Berners-Lee. And it does exactly what it says on there. Um, the carbon, carbon footprint of everything, it takes kind of, not everything, because that would be a very big book, but it takes kind of different items um, and looks at the carbon footprint of those. Um, and it's a fascinating book. It sounds dry, but it's incredibly well written and you will then see the carbon footprint of everything, um, which is very helpful. And just in case you're wondering, bananas aren't that bad, kind of pretty good. Um, so I've also put, I've taken one example from, from that book. Um, it's about a heart bypass. And the total carbon footprint for a heart bypass is 1.1 tonnes of CO2, which is equivalent to a return flight between London and Madrid. And the breakdown for that is kind of, it's the, it's the medicines, the instruments, the electricity and fuel, they're always kind of a large part of it. The transport for the, for the patient themselves and, and the staff, and it's kind of like dealing with other things. But the reason why I'm highlighting this, because if we can kind of prevent, we can do preventive medicine and prevent that person needing a heart bypass, you've already saved a huge amount of, um, of greenhouse gases. So if you can kind of make them, um, kind of try and persuade them to live a healthier lifestyle, then you've already saved all this um, carbon footprint. So one of the things we've done is um, I set up the sustainability group in IPEM in February, 2020. Um, the aims of promote environmental sustainability to and within medical physics and engineering, engage and support members on environmental sustainability, advise IMPM trustees on environmental sustainability, and engage with others, including manufacturers and funding bodies, to try and kind of promote environmental sustainability. But mostly, that I kind of I set it up to kind of create a network, a place to share good practice and to share ideas. Because when you're starting on this kind of like this kind of journey, if you like, to try and improve the carbon footprint of yourself and your workplace, it can be quite lonely. Um, so if you have this kind of network as well, it can, you know, when you meet other like-minded people, it can really help. Um, 
this is our website at the bottom if, if, anyone's, is, if anyone's interested. So, so far we've done, we've only been around for like two years, I was getting on for three. And um, we've had quite a few sessions at conferences. Um, we've had, um, we've done, given introductory lectures, lectures to um, clinical science trainees. That's an ongoing thing. We've had magazine articles. We've started some carbon footprinting projects, one of which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we've written to quite a few manufacturers about various things. And I'll talk about an example of that as well. We've had invited talks and webinars such as this. And we've also written an editorial in, in clinical oncology to kind of just start the discussion off really. Because unfortunately we're still in the, um, the kind of raising awareness stage rather than really doing much about it. So, but one thing I wanted to note is um, there's always this kind of talk about kind of going back to face-to-face -face meetings after COVID. Um, the IPM involved military group has never met face-to-face, -face, nor do I ever intend it to meet face-to-face. -face. Um, and actually, counter everything, it's kind of it's been enabled by holding it via Teams rather than kind of disabled by it. Um, it's kind of it's an, an out, allowed us to network very easily. You can kind of it can fit between kind of people's meetings and around people's lives. So it's absolutely enabled it rather than kind of disabled it. Um, so networking can be done online. So this is one of the examples of why why we've um, written to some of the manufacturers. Um, people talk about packaging a lot, um, and this is one example that I had. So we, we got sent um, some CDs um, by by Alexa. It had the Monaco on it and it was put in a Jiffy bag, which makes sense. And then that was put in another quite large box and that, you know, in for penny and for pound, put it in a different, another box. This seems like kind of a massive overuse of, of packaging, um, sort of on the, le on the level of Amazon really. Um, so we kind of wrote a letter to them um, through IPM and a few other societies to kind of try and get some discussion about what to do about that. Um, we're still in those discussions. Um, I've also looked at a kind of carbon footprint of a face-to-face -face conference versus um, an online conference. This is based on Estro um, in 2018, and it was in Barcelona because they and they kind of have used the kind of the, the list of delegates they kind of tend to send out. I looked at you can then kind of use an online cal calculator to work out the carbon footprint of the flights using kind of rough portions of where people came came from. Um, that book I keep talking about, how bad are bananas? has a kind of a, a, a estimate of the carbon footprint of um, different types of hotels. And then I've kind of, in that book again, there's a kind of, it talks about a unit, the carbon footprint of a university. And I've said that's probably a roughly equivalent to an event space. And then looked at online. So um, I kind of assumed that only 5% of people watching online would be working, would be working from home. That's kind of, Probably not quite right. Certainly at the Christie, we still there's still quite a lot of working from home. Um, so I just broke it down by the kind of estimates of how many people travel by different forms of transport. And in that book again, how about of ours? I've not got I'm not on commission. It's just a very good book. Um, it talks about the energy efficiency of kind of different um, laptops and different PCs and the servers and networks. And you can put that all together, and these results. So the face face conference. Is almost about is almost seven thousand tons of CO two equivalent, and online this is this is for everyone in total, all the delegates. Um, online it was ninety tons, so the difference between that is seventy six times bigger. So seventy six times more carbon inefficient, um, or kind of carbon footprint inefficient to to go to do a face to face conference compared to an online one. And as I said earlier, it's always always travel. Flights are like almost ninety percent of the carbon footprint of an online event. Now, I've not looked at everything so that this is going to going to be a, a vast simplification, but it gives you an idea um, about you know the impact of of, of online meetings, um, sorry, face to face meetings. Um, so one thing you can do is you can get a train. So in Esther twenty twenty, um, I organized I organized to go um, from Manchester to Vienna by train with a few other people. Um, the turn flight, well, basically, kind of a, a train is twenty two times less um, has less um, 22 times less carbon footprint than a flight does so you can either go once by plane or you can go every 20 every every year for 22 years by by train but in the end um it was on um, online so it was very low and there's this kind of train line i've got a very nice website that helps you to kind of plot out the routes um to you know anywhere in europe and it's kind of quite nice if you if you want to do that so there's another reason why if, um face-to-face -face versus online conferences um 
do different things. There's this very nice paper that shows the benefits of, or the other benefits of doing online meetings. Basic broaden, broadens access. Um, it allows more early career researchers to attend uh, rather than just um, the professors. It allows more women to attend. I think that's mainly down to kind of like the kind of the, the fact that the burden of childcare is tends to be with the women. Um, but if they're kind of you can just join from home, it makes that much easier. Um, and it also made it more ge geographically diverse because there's not the back the kind of the, the, the barriers of, of having to catch catch planes. So are there al some alternatives we could use? Um, hybrid approaches have kind of already been um, tried. Like they're kind of they're tricky, but they they do have some do have lots of benefits. Um, could we do them alternatively? So rather than holding a conference, um, so you kind of do it online one year, face to face the next year, or have it two years online and then third you have it face to face, or you can have it distributed. So you have kind of the the conferences held like a regional conference is held in each one that all link to the, the larger conference, or simply hold it less. Um, I'm not sure how many of you kind of get to go to Estros and Astros and stuff like that, but quite regularly it's it's, it's quite repetitive. So I think every three years is probably enough. Um, Anyway, yeah, so comfort putting in healthcare is something that has started to happen. Um, but I personally think more of it needs to happen so that we can kind of make this move away from or kind of reduce our comfort print in a kind of evidence led way. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about these. As these are some of the ones that have happened so far. Um, these are ones that are more in medical physics. Um, there's been this very nice study that's actually relatively old now um, looking at um, treating cancer with um, two different methods, one of one of which um, involve one trip and one of which involved 15 trips and look at the difference in comfort in there um, and it was quite significant and there's ones that um, have measured the energy consumption and therefore comfort print um, of CT and MR scans and then a few others that are kind of um, exist as well but it's still very early days in a lot of this so we got some money from Greener um, NHS to look at the comfort print of radiotherapy um, and we looked at um, travel, imaging, the treatment of the LILAC itself, including SF6, which is the gas that's within the waveguide, which does leak out a little bit. Um, idle power of the LILAC, because when the, when the machine's not treating, it's still using quite a lot of, um, of power. Look at the, kind of the, the effect of consultations, because people have to travel back and forth with those, and PPE during, during COVID times. And we looked at this for breast and prostate patients, um, and for travel, we looked at the, the we got the postcode from Mosaic, which is a kind of bit like ARIA, um, and used an online route planner to work out the distance. Um, you can look at the amount of imaging that a patient has had, it again, on kind of um, um, patient record systems. And then there's literature to say that what the conversion factor from that is. We um, took some power measurements on the Linux to see how much energy they use for different treatments. And this SF6, we kind of just weighed the cylinders. The reason why SF6 is interesting because although it's um, not much leaks out of the of the, the Linux, it's 26,000 times um, more effective a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is. So it only takes a very small amount of it to have a big impact. Um, then consultations, we looked at Mosaic and um, for PPE, we just we interviewed the RADs, to, the radiographers, to see how much PPE is used um, per patient and then kind of multiplied that up. So this is the answer. Um, we, you know, we looked deliberately at um, pre-COVID and during COVID because there'd been a few changes in kind of practice that we thought might be interesting. We only looked at kind of 10 patients for in each of these, there's only 40 patients in overall. So actually the kind of the, the, the noise of it is that it kind of is, yeah, basically a bigger study needs to happen really, but it's quite indicative. Um, and the, ne the next slide, this one probably shows it best. Um, that travel is sorry, somewhere between 17 to 80% of the carbon footprint of, a, of radiotherapy com comes from the patient travel. Um, the idle power of the LINAC is also quite significant. That's probably about 10, 15% is just the kind of the, the LINAC just sitting idly um, does have quite a large carbon footprint. SF6, the orange one, you can also see, so that is pretty significant. PPE um, was definitely there for the COVID um, cohort but the actual treatment itself is doesn't really register that much and we've set kind of quite um, narrow boundaries for this um if you kind of look at kind of the immobilization staff travel 
um, the building, the, the kind of the making of a, a machine itself, this would obviously kind of, um, this is just a lower estimate on the kind of the carbon footprint itself. So the kind of the, somewhere between 150 and 250 kilograms of CO2 equivalent was the, the patient, um, per patient, the carbon footprint of radiotherapy. But that is just very much a lower bound because we've ignored quite a lot of things just just so we can actually kind of do the study really. Um, so what next? Um, because we've shown that travel is a kind of a, a big part of the carbon footprint of radiotherapy, we'd like to look at compare standard and high fractionated radiotherapy because we'd think that if you're kind of only having five fractions as opposed to 15, 20, 30 fractions, that would significantly reduce your carbon footprint and there are social benefits as well. Um, so we've submitted an, an IHR application or have resubmitted one, um, which would be a multi-center look at this as well. And we'd also extend the boundaries of what we're looking at. So all of the things I said, or a lot of the things I said we, we, we ignored for this, this small pilot study would include for the full study. And there's a, we also would, we've also been talking to the, um, one of the manufacturers about this and the aim is to work with them more and more because you know, they, they, they kind of make the machines for us. Um, so what next? We'd like to publish the carbon footprint of the radiotherapy pathway. Um, we've put an application through the carbon footprint and um, get some money through the carbon footprint of um, SPET and PECT, SPET and PECT, PET and SPECT, um, as kind of each part of the, the kind of patient pathway and each part of medical physics will have a carbon footprint. And we need to look at those each to see kind of where the best place to kind of um, focus attention is. Um, also, we'd like to look at the carbon footprint of brachytherapy um, because anything that's theatre based, um, so some of the papers I like showed earlier were theatre based and surgery has quite a large carbon footprint um, because there's the, um, yeah, lots of lights, the, the HVAC systems, the, the um, air conditioning and heating is going to quite a large, so it'd be very interesting to look at that and obviously there's the kind of transport of the sources and stuff like that. Um, but we need you, everyone needs to join kind of this um, movement really. Um, so if you're kind of, if you're um, Europe based and you're going to Estro, you'd like to take the train, then please join us. So the idea is to go, um, I'm gonna go by train from Manchester to Vienna. Um, and it, the idea is to get kind of as many groups as possible so we can almost make it kind of like a, a pre-Estro meeting on the train. Or if you wanna set up a group similar to the IPREM group, I just want to hear more, then please contact me. Um, these are my contact details and we need to kind of make this a, a movement and actually kind of get some action on climate change. Um, so in summary, um, I believe that if climate change occurred over the same time scales as COVID happened, we'd be absolutely turning our lives upside down to solve it, even more than we did with COVID, because it is going to be a bigger problem. Unfortunately, it just happens slowly. Um, also think that if we could see the world our kids are going to live in in 20 to 30 years time we'd be treating it as the absolute emergency it is currently we're just kind of tinking around the edges but really we need to be absolutely changing everything and quickly um yeah and as i said carbon footprint projects of the kind of one we've started i feel we need um so we can kind of make reduction strategies evidence-led so we can find the hot spots um because they're not always what you imagine and use that and kind of use those things as a benchmark to then see what happens see what happens when we do reduce those things um and like i said if you're keen to get involved or hear more then these are my contact details and it's a little bit early but it gives plenty of time for questions thank you very much thank you very much this was great uh, i have a few questions but before that i see a question from dr van dyke uh, the question is, would there be uh, much benefit in going back to the use of COBOL-60 versus LINAR? Good question. Um, <laughs> I've not looked at that. Um, it's, it's weirdly that someone mentioned that yesterday as a question as well. So it's, it's obviously a thing in people's heads. It would be nice to know. Um, there's also been quite a lot of questions about, um, so we use quite a lot of satellite centers in the UK. So the Christie has kind of got a main center and then I think three satellite centers. There's quite a regular question, does, does that actually help? Because although you're reducing the travel for those patients, you have, you know, the, um, the carbon footprint of cement and building a, a building is vast as well. So, you know, a, a lot of patients would have to use that center for the carbon, the carbon footprint of building it to be offset sort of thing. Um, so that's something I also look at at some point, but to answer that person's question, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, there's another question from Dr. Um, Dr. Dimitrianet. 
Perhaps you may consider asking the speaker about non-greenhouse alternatives to SF6 gas as G3. See, for instance, uh, Kifil et al, uh, green gas to replace SF6 um, in electrical grids from the IEEE Power and Energy Magazine. Yeah, no, no. I see um, you shaking your head, yeah, so yeah. I, I kind of, um, um, yeah, the, kind of the wind turbine industry uses quite a lot of SF6. And there's the whole point of wind turbines is to kind of try and move away from um, or try and reduce our carbon footprint. They've spent quite a lot of time working out alternatives to SF6 for those. And it is something that the indus uh, kind of like industry could use. I, like, I mean, it depends. It kind of, there's always a compromise, right? If the kind of if it gets reduced to the carbon footprint of that gas, it's possible that it's maybe not as effective as being as stopping arcing, which is what it's used for in the Linux. So, yeah, but an alternative would be nice. <laughs> Simple swap out. <laughs> Does um, the pipeline, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, RG. I just had a question regarding that. Uh, what has the response been from vendors? Like, I know you showed the Electa packaging. Like, I received something from Varian yesterday. It was kind of insane uh, the way they packed it. But what has the response been from vendors and also different organizations that you have reached out to? Yeah, it's like, there has been responses, and a lot of them say they're working on it. But a lot of them then kind of point to the fact there's like kind of regulatory issues because especially like with them, um, the Br Bracky one is one that's mentioned a lot. The packaging that they get from that just seems stupid. But then at the same time, there's like another kind of you're transporting a radioactive isotope or seed or something like that. So then they've kind of got quite a lot of strict things they need to do to in order to change the packaging. So I think it's in their minds, but it's complicated um, as it always is. That's the kind of worry about this. We need to be moving fast, but it's all so complex. You can't change one thing without it affecting something else. Um, so ideally, we would ideally I would have been given this presentation in the 1990s. Granted, I would have been too young, but it would you know that's that's the kind of time scale about how far ago this should have been really happening, so that we could be at the right place now. Um, yeah. So that that turned into a needless rant, but yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Dr. Pipen, uh, Pipen said. Um, Cobalt would not reduce the travel factor, even worse in cases that um, hyperfractionation is effective. So I guess yeah. you'd agree with that, right? Um, uh, Stefano Pica. Hi, thanks for tackling this interesting and timely topic. Two comments. Number one, travel and remote work. Since COVID, our dosimetrists and physicists work from home 30 to 50% of the time. It would be great to calculate the saved um, CO2 if all clinics did the same. Yeah, there's a, there's a group in the US that I think is is looking at that exactly that question. Um, because it yeah, because it it makes a lot of, it's a nice one. However, there um, I'm not sure what it's what it's like everywhere else, but we have there's going to general drift back to face to face stuff. So yeah, trying to keep it so that that um everyone you know basically that gets a critical mass of people that are in, you feel weird being the one that's at home, right? So it's it's hard to kind of make sure that it doesn't kind of break down once you put it in. Um, the Christie's going to manage to do it quite nicely so that Teams is used kind of regularly. I think the satellite center has helped for that. The university is definitely moving more face-to-face -face over, over time. Um, yeah, but I, I, I agree that's an interesting study, and I think someone in the US is starting to do that. I don't know. I don't know where, and I realize that. And I realize the US is massive, but. <laughs> Uh, the second uh, comment uh, was, please rethink using having one less child, because while the other examples on the graph, on that graph are quite true, the use of a plane causes a measurable emission. The child examples is only true uh, statistically. Yep, yep, Looking at right. the past and extrapolating to the future, that is assuring that we are unable to educate our children and differently than our parents were educated, we need to provide better education to our children on climate and environment, rather than simply having fewer children evidence for this. Are those starts like 1% of human creates sex emission? It's not yeah, about that, that's, 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 that's also, that's also uh -huh. why I followed it with the slide about um, the equity, because kind of, you know, you know, it depends where that child is brought up as well. So yeah, because if they, if they're brought up in kind of Bangladesh, their kind of impact overall will be much, 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 much less than someone that's brought up in the US. So it kind of, yeah, I completely agree with that comment. Yeah, I did notice that in that slide where you talked about the richest 1% cause double the carbon dioxide, it was more wealth driven as opposed to China, India were so low uh, in that graph. 
yeah. was yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, the statistics and the numbers around this are fascinating. <laughs> and it really tells you, I mean, and, was, and that's ignoring like historical emissions as well, right? That's just where we are now. Um, and it's kind of, I think like historical emissions wise, like the US is up to almost like 50% of the entire carbon footprint that's ever been released is from the US sort of thing. Um, there's, I saw that stat the other day, um, but yeah, it's kind of that, it's kind of the kind of the, the equity of all of it and how you enable kind of less developed countries to carry on developing because um, you can't just stop them. You kind of, you basically, this is where the, 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 the COP27 and that the um, damage and loss thing is so important because what you need to do is kind of use the money from the wealthier con countries to enable, kind of make, allow the like the lower development countries to skip past fossil fuels and go directly to, to um, solar and wind. Now, having said that, China is, by far the biggest implement implementer of um solar and wind so it's kind of it's already happening to a certain extent now psychologically speaking uh with the group that you travel you know to estro and stuff to uh through train uh with your colleagues like how do they feel uh meeting in person as opposed to meeting virtually like you know person to person interaction um what has their response been just out of curiosity um, so it kind of it depends from person to person really um i think there's definitely this feeling that um kind of more junior members and trainees definitely miss out on the face-to-face -face meetings because like yeah as a kind of i'm kind of more senior so i've kind of i've got my network of people i can just like phone up and say hello um whereas if you're kind of you're younger you're kind of missing out on that um so it's a, it's again it's a co complex topic right um and it's again um where man the manufacturers need to be engaged in that as well because the the kind of face to face events happen partly because they they can they fund it um but also they can then they 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 use that to kind of sell their products and stuff like that um so it's again it's always complicated <laughs> um but it, but we have got to, we have got to move away from it uh, the carbon footprint of of conferences is, is absolutely vast and uh, kind of a, a slide i did have um i have had in previous talks is like kind of imagining what you know it, it, when my kids kind of grow up and say say in 10 years time they turn around and like dad look at the planet what the hell's going on what did you do about it i want to have an answer for it right and just just saying kind of you know like kind of did you stop flying dad mm -hmm. and it's like well, yeah, but I went to conferences because I had to. Is you know, it's gonna be, we need to start thinking about this because, you know, there's also a lag on. If we stopped releasing any greenhouse gases now, it's it'd still get warmer. A lot of those positive feedback loops would still occur. So we need to it kind of. It, there's a big lag in it, and it's important we act now and big. Um, and I think it's just hard to kind of get that context across because it, it's such a complex problem. Everything, every time you look at anything even with the packaging, it's complicated. <laughs> You'd have thought yeah. just, well, just put it in a smaller box would be quite easier, but even that is not easy. True. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's gonna, it's gonna take time. It's just unfortunate we haven't got it. Um, <clears throat> it's, it just requires more people to actually really kind of be aware that this is the important issue. Yeah. I have uh, two remarks. I mean, if you don't mind, uh, uh, one of them is that, uh, in low income countries, I mean, they are still uh, uh, in the process of trying to get a better standard of living, longer, yeah, yeah. Longe lo lo uh, higher longevity, which will also affect the use of healthcare, you know, uh, more intense healthcare, and the population is still growing. Uh, and from a justice point of view, I mean, it would be really unrealistic or unfair i mean basically to say well you know you have to stop developing because i mean it creates more impact on the climate yeah. uh, control the other thing is that you pointed correctly that even if we increase tremendously our efforts to not uh, continue to uh, produce uh, uh, gases co2 uh, methane and so on um that's not enough. I mean, there, there is an issue about trying to uh, implement process of sequestration because, I mean, there is, you know, 
there is, I mean, the pr predictions, even if we were to adhere to the, you know, to the recommendations in 10, 20 years, I mean, we still will be still increasing our um, global warming. Um, and the other th uh, remark is um, the issue of travel, I mean, at least that for conferences and so on. I mean, one thing which I think you correctly pointed out, hyperfractionation hyper, hyper uh, would be probably a big factor in terms of avoiding people traveling so much. But for conferences, perhaps increasing the amount or the, or the relative weight of local conferences rather than international, you know, global conferences where there is so much travel involved. And, and you know, yeah, that, 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 requires, that requires like changing the whole way academia works because like, you know, the kind of, the, there's a big weight to the big conferences aren't there. Um, and yeah, that's beyond anyone, I think. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, agreed. Um, and that's kind of why that, I think kind of holding the big conferences, but doing it kind of you know, like distributed and you can have use kind of like, you know, the, the kind of internet to kind of join them all up is probably the the best way. Um, but that's kind of that's been up and not tried or tested yet. So that's kind of probably quite a long way away. Mm -hmm. And again, that would kind of how would that work with the manufacturers because they wouldn't then that wouldn't then be there a kind of central place for them to kind of um, you know show off their things. <laughs> We have a question and a comment from Andrew Scott. Uh, he said, great presentation. Surprised to see the traveling taking such a big percentual impact and your overall emissions, but it puts the focus on reducing the number of sessions and visits needed as you alluded uh, to by mentioning hyperfractionation. In your graph, did you consider the SF6 impact every time you replace it in the Linux system? Or did you assume this is recovered through recycling and only accounting for the leakage. So that was only accounting for leakage. I don't think that was for like when it was re when it's replaced. Um, yeah, so it's probably yeah. a kind of a lower estimate. I think almost everything we've done is a lower estimate, really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Again. The next uh, the next question uh, probably a sore spot for uh, people in the US uh, is uh, another important aspect, <clears throat> at least in the Netherlands. Not sure how this is organized elsewhere is the carbon footprint of the investments of insurance companies. Uh, yeah. So I believe putting pressure here is crucial as well. Any thoughts? I know about national, but are there international initiatives uh, here? Not that I know of, but I completely agree. Um, that kind of in where our kind of money is invested is important because if it's, I think there's a big, there's a big um, move in the, I think in the UK, um, well, like, like, activists are currently targeting Barclays, for instance, because they're investing in fossil fuels and anyone that's got money invested in them is going to essentially kind of investing in fossil fuels. There's a very nice website called Green Bank or something like that, where you can basically put in what your bank is and it tells you where it's investing the money and whether it's kind of ethical bank or not. So that's one place to go and kind of check. You can kind of put in your bank account and check what it's doing. Um, yeah, because there's, there's kind of, it's not obvious because some of the some of the less known banks are, are pretty good. Um, you know, HSBC and Barclays are not great as you'd expect, but yeah, it's worth going to. Yeah, the battle of insurance will will be quite tough in US for sure. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> any other questions, Sarah? Uh, there April? was one on the bottom that uh, it says, "I think junior staff and trainees may miss out on on learning." If working from home because they miss uh, they may miss opportunities to see any little cases that would see if they have been on site. I would like to add to that also. Uh, it bothered me a little uh, to divert I guess the focus because I do not think women should be able to attend more conferences. I think women should have more balanced life and the responsibilities should be shared. So the focus should be yeah. on that. Yeah. Same thing goes to the junior trainees, right? They should not. They should be able to attend more so conferences than the professors than the, <laughs> the ones that already attended the lot, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I feel like that's just a band aid. They <laughs> say, okay, they're going to attend there, right? True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have another question um, or maybe a comment. I read a while ago that actually a vegetarian diet is not um, 
the best way to go if you want a more sustainable or green uh, community, I guess. And I was under the impression that going towards a flexitarian diet, something similar to, I guess, the Mediterranean diet, where you have uh, consumption of meat, but in moderation, might be actually better than being pure vegetarian. I don't know if you've come across that um, it's, I mean, it depends where you look at it. Like, if, if everyone on the planet went to flexitarian, we'd be in a better, much better place. Um, but like, kind of, uh, v- vegans better than all of them. Vegetarians next up, then flexitarian, and then meat eater. But like, kind of, basically, kind of the, the the less meat you can eat, the better. Especially if it's red meat. Red meat is especially bad. Um, white meat is kind of like you know chicken and stuff like that is a bit is a bit better. But um, yeah, but the vegetarian is absolutely better than being um a meat, any meat eating meat. And a lot a lot of this comes from like the kind of the use of soy. Everyone always says like kind of how vegetarians eat a lot of soy. Um, there's there's some I can't remember the numbers is, but most of the production of soy goes into animal feed, which means that kind of actually the kind of vegetarians have very little effect on that soy. Um, so yeah, it, it's 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 not true. It's like vegetarianism is better for the planet than being a meat eater. Irrelevant of how much you eat. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, there are a couple of things that I did not understand. Well, you, you might have said it, but I missed it. Uh, one when you said once when you said we need five Earths if we all live like the US, right? In terms of what? In terms of resources, or in terms of like uh, I, I, I didn't understand five Earths. Yeah, resources. Five. Yeah, okay. basically, kind of, the, kind of if if everyone on the planet lived like an American we'd need the resources of five planets rather than resources of one. Okay, thank you, about that. Thank you for that. Also in the COVID versus uh, pre-COVID cases, there was another element other than uh, the transportation, right? Or travel part, um, which was, I think the idle time of the machine. And it looked like for the prostate, it was different than for breast cases. So the idle time was longer, I guess, for pre-COVID for prostate uh, and so, also for breast. Um, but why is that? I didn't understand. Um, I'm not well, sure about that. I think, I think, I mean, it's because we only looked at 10 patients, it's all divided up a bit kind of incorrect. Well, it's not statistically significant, any of the stuff that we've done, I don't think, because it's only 10 cases. Um, this is the argument for kind of making a bigger study of it as well, because because um, actually when, when we did the, um, we kind of basically got the non, the kind of pre-COVID and the COVID prostate, the COVID prostate had 5% of hyperfractionation in it. So you'd have expected that to go down for the travel. But it didn't because just those 10 patients just happened to travel further than the 10 in the pre-COVID. So, but it's all just due to like low numbers, really, I think, a lot of it. So don't take out too much of it for now. Okay. <laughs> I think the, kind of the portions are correct and the kind of the the um, total carbon footprint is a lower bound. But about from, apart from that, I wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Any any more questions from the audience? I don't see any, but this is definitely, I love your passion on this topic. And uh, <laughs> I, I know for sure, I'll probably be uh, reaching out to you uh, about this for sure. Uh, yeah, I do appreciate you talking about this and uh, educating thank us. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah, yeah this me. is really nice, yeah. No, and I agree about the loneliness part because um, I lived in Boston, right, the East Coast. So, and then I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is more in the Midwest. So, different demographics, different schools of thoughts. And I was very upset when I noticed that they don't even have recycling bins, right, in the clinic. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, at least have a recycle. But then slowly, I start, I start going their way, right, because again, if you're alone, you, I guess, you just follow the herds, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's nice to have listen to talks like yours, and it does ignite that inside us, right? Like, oh no, no, we need to pay attention. We need to. Uh, yeah, exactly. We can't, all, we can't all ignore it. <laughs> and educate others. Yes. Yeah? So thanks a lot. I really enjoyed the talk a lot. Cool. Excellent. Thank you, much, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so Bye. much. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Sorry? Have a good day. All okay, right. did you stop recording? Do you, you want to do it? I'll let you do it, uh, RJ. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. I'll stop. Yeah.